This year, I was lucky enough to draw a very special limited tag that allowed me to hunt one of the rarest and least hunted subspecies of deer in the country using a muzzle-loaded black powder rifle. For this hunt, I'll be using a gun that's over 150 years old. It is an original P-53 infield rifled musket that was used in the Civil War. Over the last several years, I've enjoyed the challenge of learning how to hunt big game with homemade primitive archery equipment made from all natural materials. Oregon is the perfect place to perfect these hunting skills as we have large populations of black-tailed deer which live on the west side of the state and are known for having branched antlers and thick black wide tails and mule deer which live on the eastern part of the state and have large ears and a thin rope-like tail. Oregon is also home to two distinct subspecies of white-tailed deer, the larger Idaho white-tailed deer which lives in the northeastern part of the state and the smaller Colombian white-tailed deer, which lives in small, isolated pockets on the western side of the state. The Colombian white-tailed deer was first noted by Lewis and Clark in their journals dated March 28, 1806, when they were visiting near the mouth of the Willamette River. Early pioneers to western Oregon found abundant numbers of Colombian white-tailed deer, but over time their population decreased until 1973, when their populations were so low they were placed on the federal endangered species list. Currently, there are two small populations of Columbian white-tailed deer, one along the Columbia River and a second in the Umpqua Basin in Douglas County. The population along the Columbia River remains protected as their numbers are too low. However, the population in the Umpqua Basin has increased and in 1995 was removed from the federal endangered species list. Each year, a very limited number of tags are made available to hunt Columbian white-tailed deer in the southern population. Most of these deer live on private land, so there's very little opportunity for the general public to hunt these deer. Several landowners do offer guided hunts. However, a guided Colombian whitetail hunt runs between five and $7,000. There is, however, one large piece of publicly owned land that allows limited number of hunting tags for Colombian whitetail deer. This property is known as the North Bank Habitat and is under the stewardship of the Bureau of Land Management. It is nearly 6,000 acres in size and is a perfect area to hunt Colombian white-tailed deer. I personally don't own the type of muzzleloader that was required for this hunt, so I turned to a friend who is an expert in black powder guns. He has a large collection of cap lock and flintlock rifles and was generous enough to let me select a gun out of his collection for this hunt. After shooting several of his black powder guns, I was drawn to his original 577 caliber infield rifled musket. Infields are incredibly accurate and were used in every single battle in the Civil War. Over a million of them were imported from England and used both in the Northern troops and were very popular among Southern Confederate soldiers. This particular gun I used for this hunt was likely used in the Civil War and still bears the initials JMCH-107 carved into the stock. This gun is very fun to shoot and I was surprised by its accuracy as my first two practice shots hit slightly above the mark in a tight group. For this hunt, I will be shooting a lead ball that is wrapped in the same type of paper cartridge that was used during the Civil War. To begin, we poured some melted lead into a mold. Next, we cut out a trapezoidal piece of paper, placed the lead ball at the base of the paper, and then rolled the paper into a tube. We then twisted the paper at the base of the tube around the lead ball so that it was tight and filled the tube with the appropriate charge of black powder. We then sealed the black powder into the cartridge by folding the top of the paper at a 45 degree angle and then again down at a 90 degree angle. To secure the fold, you then tuck the loose tail back under the 45 degree angle. The last step is to dip the bottom of the paper cartridge with the lead ball into a melted mixture of beeswax and deer fat. This will help form a seal as it is placed in the barrel of the gun. To shoot these cartridges, simply tear off the top of the paper and pour the loose black powder into the barrel. Then place the lower half of the cartridge with the lead ball into the barrel, cut off the loose paper, and then seat the lead ball down in the base of the barrel using the ramrod.
To fire the gun, you use a percussion cap that ignites the powder when it is struck by the hammer. To aim, you line the back of the V-knock up with the front bead and the target you want to hit. Early in my hunt, I quickly learned just how wary and skittish Colombian white-tailed deer are. Their keen sense of smell, sight, and hearing make them very difficult to sneak within range. The biggest advantage I had was this hunt took place in late November and early December when the bucks are still moving around looking for does. I'd spend a good part of the afternoon scouting a hillside looking for deer. Here, you can see under the base of this tree in a large patch of poison oak, is a bedded buck that I tried to sneak up on. Here bedded in the tip of the shadow is a very large white-tail buck that is hanging out with a smaller white-tail buck and eight black-tail does. In both situations, as I moved to within range for a shot, I paused to set up my camera gear and these weary white-tail bucks sensed something was wrong and took off, leaving the eight black-tail does behind to feed in the meadow, unaware of the danger. Finally, on the third day of my hunt, I was able to get within range of a mature Colombian white-tailed buck. So after three days of hard hunting, I got my Colombian white-tailed buck. I learned a lot about these deer. I'm used to hunting blacktail and mule deer, and these white-tail are just so skittish. Uh, they were really hard to get close to. Um, I didn't get the kill on camera because the first two days I kept trying to set up the camera when I'd see a buck and they would just bust out of there. It was too hard to set up the camera and then go shoot it um, without them busting. So I uh, came this morning, got on a high vantage point to glass and looked for deer and the fog just rolled in. It was so thick, I couldn't see very far in front of me. So I went to plan B, which worked out great. That was to um, go through an area that I know they're in. It's kind of an oak scrubby area with a lot of poison oak. And I just uh, moved so slowly, steel hunted from tree to tree, waited and looked, waited and looked, and came through uh, several groups of does, and then uh, finally saw this guy on a hillside and slowly moved in. The fog was just thick, and uh, I sat by a tree and waited, and he eventually came by at 40 yards, and uh, the shot was perfect. It was just right high behind the shoulder, and it just rolled him over. He was dead instantly. That... Um, Infield rifle is just so accurate. It put the bullet right where I wanted it to and it knocked it down like a, a ton of bricks. So it's really cool to be able to hunt with a gun that was used in the Civil War and to take a deer with it, especially a special deer like a Colombian whitetail. Thanks for watching and um, just thanks for learning about using a Civil War gun with me. I'm thankful for the opportunity to hunt and to be able to provide high quality wild meat for my family. When I harvest an animal, I make sure nothing goes to waste. I use the bones, antler, and sinew for primitive tools and tan the hide using the brain. If you're interested in hunting with historical weapons, check out some of my other videos on YouTube. I cover everything from ancient primitive arrows to medieval archery to the more classical traditional archery.